أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أمالنا من يهده الله فلا مدل له ومن يدلله فلا هادي له ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تكاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تسالون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله كولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يتي الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعد فإن خير الحديث كتاب الله وإن خير الهدي هدي محمد مصطفى صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدع وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار أما بعد يا إخوة المسلمين يا عباد الله all thanks and praises due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Indeed, we glorify Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we seek His mercy, His blessings, and we beg for His forgiveness. I testify to the fact that there's absolutely no deity, no one worthy of any deification except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for He's indeed alone and has no partners. And whomsoever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides, none can lead astray, and whomsoever He left astray, none can provide guidance to. And I bear witness that Muhammad ibn Abdullah Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is indeed the last and final messenger. وَمَا أَرَسَّلْنَكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةَ لِلْعَالَمِينَ He was sent as a mercy, as a compassion to all of humanity, nay, all of creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. O believers, قال الله تعالى في كتاب الكريم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الناس اقبضوا ربكم الذي خلقكم والذين من قبلكم لعلكم تتكون صدق الله العظيم قال الله تعالى في كتاب الكريم يا أيها الذين آمنوا كتب عليكم السيام كما كتب على الذين من قبلكم لعلكم تتكون أيام معدودات فمن كان منكم مريدا أو على سفر فعدة من أيام أخر وعلى الذين يتيكونه فدية تعام مسكين فمن تتوع خيرا فهو خير له وأن تسوموا خير لكم إن كنتم تعلمون صدق الله العظيم وصدق رسول الله الكريم My dear brothers and sisters in Islam Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins Surah Al-Baqarah, the only surah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions Ramadan, but He begins this surah by dividing us into three categories. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins the Qur'an in this surah by dividing us into three categories. And the first category He divided us into is the believers. And He used just few criteria to qualify you as a believer. That Alif Lamim, ذلك الكتاب لا ريب فيه هدى للمتقين الذين يؤمنون بالغيب ويقيمون الصلاة ومما رزقناهم ينفقون. And Allah Subhanahu wa Taala qualified this category as the believer. And then He spent just two verses talking about the disbeliever. Then Allah Subhanahu wa Taala went extensively thirteen verses to deal with the munafikun. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala immediately fi kitab al-kareem surah al-Baqarah brought all of them together now and he is addressing them Ya ayyuhal nas O believers, O disbelievers, munafikun, kafirun, 
Mu'minun, all of you come together. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is addressing all of mankind. And he's saying, Ya ayyuhan nas. Ya ayyuhan nas, budu rabbakum alladhi khalakakum walladhina min qablikum la'allakum tattakun. It's an almost identical ayah that we're going to talk about when we come to Siyam. Except Siyam is not here. Meaning that all of humanity can attain taqwa. All of humanity before the fasting was given this opportunity to attain taqwa. How do you attain taqwa? This consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is by believing in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Submitting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّكُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, before I begin on the topic of Ramadan, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala divided us again. He sorted us out again in Quran. This time he says, Kuntum azwajan thalatha. That I will sort you out into three categories. Again. Kuntum azwajan thalatha. Three categories. And when will he sort us out this time? He will sort us out. Wa idha waqaatil waqiyah. When that which is coming arrives. And this earth is shaking violently. And that which is majestic that sits on the earth that brings stability. The Jabal will crumble into dust and he will sort us out. Kuntum azwajan thalatha fa ashabul maymanati ma ashabul maymanah. And look at the people on the right hand. What a people they are. What a people are those people of the right hand. Ashabul maymanati ma ashabul maymanah. Wa ashabul mash'amati ma ashabul mash'amah. And the people on the left. What are those people on the left? وَالسَّابِكُونَ السَّابِكُونَ And the third category of the people are those that are forging ahead in the forefront. وَالسَّابِكُونَ السَّابِكُونَ أُولَٰئِكَ الْمُقَرَّبُونَ And I want you to bear this ayah in mind because it will get encompasses into the ayah of dua in Ramadan. أُولَٰئِكَ الْمُقَرَّبُونَ That the sabikun are the people who are close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فِي جَنَّاتِ النَّعِيمِ and most of the sabikun are the people from the previous generation. It is not from this generation or the generation of the future that Muawiyah radiallahu ta'ala and the cousin of Uthman ibn Affan, the son-in-law of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was the governor of Damascus, just almost contemporary of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says that a time will come. That that which we consider to be virtuous now was a vice in the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It would be considered sinful in the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the things we consider to be sinful today will be virtuous in the future. He's talking that few of us in the future will be among the sabikun. Just to divert for a moment. The first day Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Adam alayhi salam and his consort Hawa and placed him in Jannah. Shaitan begins to work. And this is a fact that Shaitan has access even to Jannah. So there's no place where Shaitan does not have access to. So he goes to Adam alayhi salam and day one, day one, what is he going to tempt Adam alayhi salam, our father? Day one, he came to Adam alayhi salam. Fawaswasa in that sneaking, in that sneaking manner. Fawaswasa ilayhi shaitan. Ya Adamu. Oh Adam. Hal adulluka ala shajaratil khuldi wa mulkil la yabla. He said to Adam alayhi salam, Oh Adam, how about if I show you a way? How about if I guide you to a to immortality and to a kingdom that will never decay. La yabla. You know, if you look at all the people that achieve this dominion right now, whether you look at the CEO for Facebook or you look at Jeff Bezos, the CEO for Amazon, the richest man on the planet, over a hundred billion dollars. Whether you look at Dimitri, one of the richest men in Russia. These are all people under the age of 50. When you look at Paul Allen, the founder of Microsoft, you cannot use a computer without being, have access 
to what Paul Allen has done. When you look at the co-founder of PayPal, Thiel, all of them are engaged in a project where they're pumping billions of dollars into it. Facebook just pumped in $3 billion for what? They have accomplished that thing that Shaitan promised them, the power of dominion, but they have a problem. They all have a problem. They cannot come up with immortality. So they're pumping all their money into this aspect to guarantee immortality to that extent of arrogance that they're saying in 2045 that every man can live forever. Every human being will live forever if they have access. And this has been going on for quite some time. Just upstate New York in 1965, a professor by the name of McKay, he took an old rat and he took a young rat, dissected his stomach and fused them together to see if the young blood will transfuse into the old rat and reverse the age process and they discover a protein called GDF11. When I saw that, I think the only GDF I can think of is Guyana Defense Force. You know, GDF11. So there, this, is a, this is an absolutely reality of succumbing to the shaitan. That they're saying, we will not reach our master. We will beat that. We will never stand in front of our master because we will guarantee they're creating something called bionetics, where they're merging machine with human. So if you lost a limb, they're recreated where they can print, 3D print, a kidney for you in the future. Well, this is the reality of al Quran al Karim. If this doesn't give you goosebumps, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins in Surah Al-Baqarah, and you probably heard, if you listen to the Imam, in the Surah Al-Baqarah, he's talking about, Ya Bani Israel, Ya Bani Israel. And coming up to this ayah of fasting, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is presenting to the world a nation that deviated before, as if there is a lawyer, a prosecutor in the court of law, presenting a case of a nation before us. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is presenting this case in Surah Al-Baqarah, saying that this nation, Bani Israel, has deviated, has transgressed, has disobeyed their messenger. Some of them, the Nasara took one extreme and the Yahudi took another extreme. One of them take that extreme to deify their prophet as God. And one of them take the extreme to go kill him. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, this ummah is an ummah to wasata. And look at the miracle of Quran. The Prophet Wasallam, he did not put that ayah. You know where that ayah is? That ayah is in the middle of Surah Baqarah, verse 143, exactly in the middle. Ummatun wasata. You are not an extremist nation, like the people say. We are not people of extremism. We are people of moderation. We are people of moderation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is building this case in Surah Al-Baqarah. And the Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala migrated to, from Mecca to Medina. And he would look in the direction of Mecca. And his heart was attached to Mecca. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees in his face the love and the pain at the same time that his heart is attached to Mecca. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says before the ayah of fasting, Ya Rasulullah, now the capital of this new nation, it is not Aqsa anymore, it is Mecca. So the Prophet وسلم, that is our new capital. The formation, you see what the Surah Al-Baqarah is laying down the formation of a new nation. Now we have a new leader. He is Muhammad Mustafa Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And now we have a new capital, Mecca. It is not Aqsa that we see that 24 square miles of the most contested place, place on the planet Earth. And that is sacred to us. And I share the sentiment of the Prime Minister of Turkey just recently. And he says very articulately, he says, if we allow Aqsa to go, next we will allow Medina to go. And if we allow Medina to go, next we will allow, allow Mecca to go. And if we allow Mecca to go, we will allow the Tawheed, the foundation of Ibrahim to go. And then we will become Futawati Shaitan. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tell the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that the new capital now is, is Mecca. Now you have a new leader, you have a new capital. Any country in a formation, it needs now a new constitution. 
And that is where the Quran comes in, in the month of Ramadan. And if you note, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks of Ramadan, He speaks directly with Quran, not fasting. So Ramadan, first and foremost, it's about the Quran. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins. And He says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, kutiba alaykum usiyamu, that this siyam, it is not peculiar to you, this ummah, that the previous nation, they used to fast also. Before you, Muhammad وسلم, fasting was prescribed unto those before you. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying emphatically here now that one of the most potent form of coming close to Allah is through the siyam. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, O you who believe, kutiba, it is written for you. Kutiba alaykum usiyam, kama kutiba ala ladheena min qablikum la'allakum tattakoon. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did something very interesting here now. He begins to talk about the fasting of the previous nation. And he says, ayyama ma'dudat, that they used to fast for few days. Ayyama ma'dudat, it could be less than 10 days. And he's describing the fast of the previous nation. Ayyama ma'dudat. فَمَنْ كَانَ مَرِيدًا أَوْ عَلَىٰ سَفَرٍ فَعِدَّةٌ مِنْ أَيَّامٍ أُخَرٍ And if you are married, if you are sick, or if you are a musafir, if you are traveling, then you make up the compensatory fasting on like days. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَعَلَى الَّذِينَ يُتِيكُونَهُ فِدْيَةٌ تُعَامُ مِسْكِينَ And you have an additional option, the previous nation. If you want that you don't want to fast, you can feed the miskeen. And the language is very important here. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if you decide to take that position, and this doesn't apply to us, Allah is describing the fasting of the previous nation. He says, if you decide to take this position, that you don't want to fast, and this is how privileged you are, the previous nation, then you feed the miskin. But he said, to'amu miskin. You give the food of the miskin, not feed the miskin. Meaning, that food, if you take a position of not fasting, if you're not doing a favor to the miskin. The miskin has a obligate, you have an obligation to give the food that really belongs to the miskin if you take that position. Subhanallah. But then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala use the rhetorical device here and rhetoric is one of the most effective form of speech and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses very effectively. Rhetoric is using words, putting construction of words without any conjunctions. So there's no and and if and but here. Like, for example, even Rome, you know, Shakespeare, one of the most effective writers, he was prolific in rhetoric. Even the most dangerous human being that to live after Pharaoh, who killed 21 million people in 12 years, he was a master of rhetoric. He was a master of rhetoric. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses rhetoric when he, when he really wants you to understand what he's saying. And he's saying to the previous nation, after he gives them this option, that when you're sick, you make up the fast. If you travel, you make up the fast. And if you opt out not to fast, you pay the fidya to the miskin. But then he says, فَمَن تَتَوَّعَ خَيْرًا فَهُوَ خَيْرٌ لَهُ وَأَن تَسُومُ خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تَعْلَمُونَ Subhanallah. He says that if what you know about fasting, it is good for you. It is better for you. It is best for you if you only have intellect to think about it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala finished talking about the previous nation and he's addressing us now. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, Shahru Ramadan alladhi unzila fihi al-Quran. Shahru Ramadan is associated with al quran al kareem And the Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Quran is so much of Ramadan that Jibreel and one of the most powerful form of learning is true orality. You know, 
the greatest way to move mankind, it is not by writing, it is by speech. You see, Obama became president by delivering one speech in New England, one speech, and his speech was in, in encompasses of rhetoric. Tony Blair, if you listen to Tony Blair, he would say education, education, education. There's no conjunction. He used using rhetoric, makes him one of the most prolific orator of modern century. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying to us that فَمَنْ شَهُ رَمَضَانَ الَّذِي أُنزِلَ فِيهِ الْقُرْآنِ that Ramadan is about Quran. That this Quran, in this month of Ramadan, the Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Jibreel would come every Ramadan and he would recite. The Prophet would recite orality, listen. A child will learn an entire language without reading a book, just by listening. A child, before the age of seven and eight, will memorize Al-Quran without knowing how to read the Quran, just by listening. That's the power of listening. And all of Quran was revealed and was master without a kitab. That is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins the Quran in the third person saying, Thalika al-kitabu la raibafi. That book, not this book, the book was not here with us. By listening, the Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the last year, Jibreel came twice to him. And he says to Aisha, radiallahu ta'ala anha, that the only thing I can think of that why Jibreel came and rehearsed the Quran twice, it's perhaps this is my last Ramadan. Think about that for a moment. Perhaps this is my last Ramadan. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Shahru Ramadan alladhi unzila fihi al-Quran hudallin nas. That this Quran is a hidayah for all of humanity. Explicitly Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, in this month of Ramadan, especially this Quran is for all of mankind. It is not for you to come in the masjid for 30 days and recite it and listen to it. There's two things going on in the masjid. In the month of Ramadan, you must do, engage in two things, recite and listen. Recite and listen. That is why you come and listen to the Imam in the Tarawih Salah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, hudallin nas. It's a hidayah for all mankind. You see, we tend to think that the shaitan, in this month of Ramadan, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala changes the normal structure of the galaxy. And he makes the gates of heaven wide open. The gates of Jahannam shut, making it difficult for you to commit something that you do that is halal out of Ramadan, it is haram in Ramadan. Look at the standard. Look at the standard. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying in this month of Ramadan, this is not only exclusive to you, that the shaitan is restricted. It is exclusive to all of humanity. So now, when you take this Quran to Hudan lin nas, their heart in this month is receptive to this message. The heart of the disbeliever is receptive to this message. And the statistics by Pew Report shows that Global Ummah, they do not pray. A lot of us do not engage in the five salah. About 15% of the world population of Muslim pray five salah. But report shows that 90% of Muslims engage in the fasting. That is the power of this month of mercy. That even the most wicked among us, they put aside our evilness because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it conducive for you to do good in this month of Ramadan. So the heart of the disbeliever is also receptive. That is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Hudallin nas. In this month, this Quran is a hidayah for all of mankind. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is thinking. You, he knows what you're thinking. So he's answering you in the next few words. That he says in Shahr Ramadan alladhi unzila fihi al-Quran, this Quran was sent down in this month of Ramadan, for a hidayah for all of mankind. Now, when you go to mankind and you tell them, listen, you know what, we fast. We fast 30 days. I know you fast for Lent and you give up one thing, but no, we fast for 30 days from the sun, before the sun rises to the sunset. We engage in abstaining from food and drinks and intimate relationship for excesses of 16 hours. And the mercy, look at the mercy. 
if you should do this, most of us in this masajid, if we should engage in abstaining from liquid outside of Ramadan, we will be in the emergency room, most of us, from dehydration. It's impossible. If the near is not there, everything changes. The near is so important. Like the near in Nikah. You just make a near. Just a second ago, that woman is illegal for you. But just the near makes her all permissible for you. Just the near, the power of near. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is making this month a month of mercy for us. And we cannot count the mercy in this month of Ramadan. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I see many of our brothers that in outside of Ramadan, they're diabetic. And I see many of them. If you go to any conventional doctor, they would say, this is very dangerous. Because as you fast, you become hypoglycemic. Your blood sugar goes down. The opposite happens when you consume a lot of sugar. When you become hypoglycemic, even physiologically, Allah prepares you to be humble. Because if somebody come and argue with you, at that state when your blood sugar is low, leave me alone, man. You know, I can't, you know. But if you have a spike of blood sugar, and it shows a correlation with a spike of blood sugar, hyperglycemia has a, a positive correlation with aggressive behavior. Subhanallah. But we don't have the time to go through the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because I want to come to one important ayah before I run out of time to put everything together, the power of this month, to lift your hands to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that when you take this hidayah to Hudalin Nas, they will ask you, where did you get this, that you got to fast 30 days? Where did you get that, you know what? Every life is created to be sacred, that if you take one life, it's as if you take all of humanity. Where do you get this, that you have to prostrate five times a day? And by prostrating five times a day, science shows the only way to protect yourself from radiation, from all these devices, is to make sujood, bring the forehead to the ground to de de detoxify all of these radiation. Al Subhanallah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they will ask you, where you come with this from? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answers them. Wa bayinati min al -huda, that the proof is right in the Quran. The proof of what you're asking about salah, it is in the Quran. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala use the word guidance again. Shahru Ramadan alladhi unzila fi al-Quran hudan lil-nas wa bayinati min al -huda, that the proof is clear, concise proof is in Al-Quran. It's not because we don't know it. It's there. And if the discourse is finished and we have a productive conversation and you agree that this Quran has the guidance, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, it is wal furqan. It is the criteria now between ju to judge men from wrong and right. This is the criteria. This is the constitution. The capital is Mecca, and Muhammad is our leader, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Allah subhanahu wa taala says, "فَمَنْ شَهِدَ مِنْكُمُ الشَّهْرَ فَالْيَسُمْ." That if you witness this month of Ramadan, you fast. Now look at compare this I this verse this these verses with the previous verse. Allah subhanahu wa taala says that He talks about Ramadan. Ramadan is associated with the Quran and then he's saying that if you witness this month you must fast and then he says وَمَنْ كَانَ مَرِيدًا أَوْ عَلَىٰ سَفَرٍ فَعِدَّةُ مِنْ أَيَّامٍ أُخَرٍ that he's saying that if you're sick you compensate for the fast if you're traveling you compensate for the fast but what's missing in this series of ayah is what was given to the previous nation وَعَلَىٰ الَّذِينَ يُتِيكُونَهُ فِدْيَةٌ تُعَامُ مِسْكِينَ no that's not for you the scholar says that is only for those who are terminally ill. Many people come to me and says, Brother Shafiq, you know my son, he's in corporate America. He's in meeting and meeting and this and board meeting and he has to be at a peak, peak mental capacity. 
that he can't fast. You know, the Quran says, Fidya tu tu'amu miskin. And so, you know what? We send in Africa, we send $35, it feed an entire family for one year. That compensates for the fasting. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is actually wants us to differentiate ourselves by a new by a new capital, a new leader, a new constitution, and also the methodology of fasting. It is not like that. Don't go back and say that we should pay a fidya and we are exclusive. We are free from that fasting. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, فَمَنْ شَهِدَ مِنْكُمُ الشَّهْرَ فَلْيَسُمْ If you live to witness this month, the option for you is fasting. The only exception if you're traveling or if you're sick. Now you're thinking, and Allah is reading your mind again here. You're thinking, you know what? This has just gotten much harder. أَيَّامُ مَعْدُودَةً They used to fast only for a few days. And then they have this option to pay a fidya. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us, you have to fast for 29, 30 days straight. And then you don't have that option. And you know what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says? يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ بِكُمُ الْيُسْرِ وَلَا يُرِيدُ بِكُمُ الْيُسْرِ He wants ease for you. That doesn't make the logic. He wants ease for us. And not only that, you see, if I go to a smart kid today that's studying one of these Ivy League institutions, and I say, Beta, I want ease for you. I don't want difficult for you, Beta. He said, Dad, Dad, relax. You said it. You want ease for me. It's implied that you don't want difficulty for me. I'm not crazy. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to understand by engaging in this fasting, by emerge yourself in this Quran, that it will be easy for you in this life. And he absolutely does not want difficulty for you. So he says, He wants ease for you and absolutely he doesn't want any difficulty for you. And why? We go back to the first ayah. What does this siyam give you? He gives you what? Taqwa. What does this Ramadan gives you? The ayah where I talk about sabikun as sabikun, ulaikal muqarrabun. That the sabikun is close to Allah. The sabikun is close to Allah. You see, closeness is very, closeness is dearness. I come from a community in Westchester where a lot of young people, they came in this country on political asylum. 10 years, 15 years, they missed their parents. If you ask any one of them, what would you want to do right now if you have an opportunity? They all will say, I wish I can go and hug my mom. I didn't see her for 10 years or my dad. Closeness is dearness. Closeness makes you conducive to do good. Because if dad is in the house, you will not take a puff. But you will take the puff if he is not there and he's at work. But when you hear the garage door is opening, you will extinguish that cigarette. And you will take all the air freshener and spray it in that room. Because closeness, it makes you more conducive to obedience. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Sabikun as Sabikun, Ulaikal Mukarrabun, Fi Jannati Naim, Thullatum min al Awaleen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, The Sabikun is close to us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bring us into that category of Sabikun. Ameen ya Rabbil Alameen. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم هو الذي لا إله إلا هو المالك القدوس السلام المؤمن المحيمن العزيز الجبار المتكبر سبحان الله سبحان الله أما يشكون الله سبحانه وتعالى he is one الله سبحانه وتعالى is mighty الله سبحانه وتعالى is majestic الله سبحانه وتعالى is magnificent الله سبحانه وتعالى is وربك تكبر he is above all which they ascribe unto him. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after he finished talking about Ramadan, the only part of Quran where he talks about Ramadan, in this surah, Surah Al-Baqarah, with 286 ayah, 6,201 words, and 25,500 letters in this surah, this is the only place he talks about Ramadan. And after he finished, he talks, he turned his attention to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
And he says, and this is one of the most beloved ayah I find in Al-Quran Al-Kareem. He says, وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ سَأَلَكَ Meaning he is addressing Rasulullah Sallallahu And he says, وَإِذَا When You see, when and if is a big difference. If I say to you, if my child come back from studying at Harvard, if he comes back, I will have a big party. That implies there is some hopelessness that he may not come back. But if I say when my beta come back, that means I have hope that he will come back. Not hopelessness, but hope. Look at the language of Allah. He says, Wa idha, when, Ya Rasulullah, when they ask of me, let me answer them. There is no directive here. There is no kul. This here, there is no kul. He didn't say, kul hu wallahu ahad. Say to them that I am one. Kul a'udhu bi rabbin nas. Say to them, ya Muhammad, that I am the Lord of mankind. Kul ya ayyuhal kafirun. Say to them that they are kafir. There is no kul here. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, wa idha sa'alaka ibadi. And he's giving you ibadi. He's calling you his servant. Giving you honor by calling you an ibad. Because one of the greatest honor that you can be given is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to call you an ibad. Because if I call you a servant, that implies that you are in servitude of me. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wa idha sa'alaka ibadi anni fa inni qareeb. Fa inni qareeb. Let me tell them that I am near. In this month of Ramadan. In this month of Ramadan, you have exclusive access 24-7 to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 24-7, I say to the people in the masajid, many masajid you go in, at the time of breaking the fast, you think that it, you're on the stock market. There they're talking about all the stocks. It's like a fish market. And the Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, the most glorified time in a believer's life is two. Two instances. One, when you see your Lord Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imagine that day. And the other is when you're about to break your fast. Don't let a second slip. Because in an authenticated hadith in Muslim, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa there is not a dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you lift your hands in those moments that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will shun that dua. I implore upon you in this time, at this juncture, in this khutbah, that make sure that you don't let these precious moments go. At tomorrow, one third of the month is gone. One third of Shahr Ramadan is gone. It cannot come back. We had one brother last year who would make tea for us. Our brother Muaz was very close to him. He was a very pious brother, Amirullah. He made tea for us every day in Ramadan. And after Shahul Ramadan, two weeks after we had a lunch. And after he shared in that lunch, al maut came the next day and took his life. He's not with us. Don't let these moments slip. وَإِذَا سَعَلَكَ ibadi. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ujib literally means response. Dawa is a da'i and he puts a tamar buta, meaning that this person that is calling is not a person that pray five times a day. It is not a person with the hijab. It is not a person with the beard. It is not a person that make the hajj. It is a person that come for the first time and he's calling on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ujib, the response is before the call. Subhanallah. Believe me, if I call you, you will say that brother Shafiq, let me think about it, then I will get back to you. Let me think if I could come and help you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, no. The response is there. Ujibu da'wata da'i iza da'an. When they call a call. The only qualification in this month of Ramadan is that you call. The only qualification in this month of Ramadan is that you call. But the most touching part of this dua is the end of this ayah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wa iza sa'alaka ibadi. That he's near to us. And 
linguistically, in the lexical of the language, it doesn't make sense, the response. Because if I ask you about Salim, if I ask you about Brother Salim, you would not tell me Brother Salim is near. It doesn't make sense. You would say, oh, Brother Salim goes to the Masjid as Siddiqui. Oh, he lives here. He has three kids. He graduated from Harvard University. He's making $200,000 a year. You would tell me all that. You will not say that he's near. That doesn't make sense. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes against the logic and wants you to know that he's near. And he says, Fastajibu. After he guarantees you all this, he says, Fastajibu li wal yu'minu bi la'allahum yarshudun. Sadaqallahu al-azim. He's saying, all I'm asking you is please try. Please make an effort. You see, only with Allah, you're rewarded for effort. Only with Allah, you're rewarded for effort. With the near, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you. Every place else in this universe, you're only rewarded for results. If you go to your boss, get it to my table, get it to my desk. I don't care how you get it to my desk, you get it to my desk. Then I will pay you results. When it comes to Allah, look at the mercy of Allah. He could have said, respond to me. He didn't say that. He says, fastajibu. Try. It's an appeal to myself, an appeal to all of us. Let us try in this month of Ramadan, set some goals, make some tangible accomplishment by the end of Ramadan. Brothers, please come forward and make room for your brothers. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you. فَاسْتَجِيبُوا لِي وَالْيُؤْمِنُوا بِي لَعَلَّهُمْ يَرْشُدُونَ This is my appeal to all of you. Dua is the only thing that we have with what's going on in Palestine. What's going on in Palestine? What's going on in Burma? You know, last week I was called to the Guyana Consulate to give a talk on Islam. And this, the, 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 the theme was unity. And the ambassador, he comes up and he talks about unity. And I said, I want to add one prayer that not let us pray for unity, but let us pray for humility when we become in a position of power. Because when you become in a position of power, you become arrogant. And it's your way or no way. And we see the arrogance that is trend, that's in, in that most blessed place. Masjid Al-Aqsa. Blatant. In the eyes of almost 2 billion believers on the planet Earth. If you count every 10 person that walk in front of you of any given street, Ten, seven of them is either Muslim or Christians. That is by statistics. But we are great in numbers, but we are weak because we abandoned the Quran al Karim. And we abandoned moments like this in Ramadan when we can raise our hands to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and make the world of difference. I appeal to you, I appeal to myself that let us not let a moment of this blessed month of Ramadan slip us away. Fill the masjid. Listen to the Quran, recite the Quran. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept our siyam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept our salah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rectify the affairs of this ummah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ala ali Muhammad kama salaita ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim innaka hamidun majid. Allahumma barik ala Muhammadin wa ala ali Muhammad kama barakta ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim innaka hamidun majid. Allahumma hdina fi man hadayt wa afina fi man afayt wa tawallana fi man tawallayt wa barik lana fi ma a'tayt wa kina sharra ma qadayt wa inna taqdi wa la yukda alayk nastagfiruka wa natubu ilayk عباد الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر